Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It is my honor this morning to wrap up our series on the book of Romans. We have made it. We are to chapter 16, and I don't know about you. Now, maybe it's only me, and I'm willing to take uh, responsibility for this, but I don't know about you, but maybe you've taken on a challenge to read the Bible through a year. Maybe at some point in your life, you chose to read a book of the Bible, and you chose the book of Romans. And maybe like me, the first time, maybe the second time, maybe the third time, you read through it, you're kind of like, oh, man, this is just like for brainy people, right? Like just kind of blew your mind and, and maybe you liked the challenge and you dug in and you kind of learned and you, and you focused and you did some study and you got out commentaries and encyclopedias and you did word studies and did all that stuff to find out what everything in Romans meant. Anyone? Anyone? Maybe not. I didn't the first couple times I did, and, and for me it was kind of brainy, you know, and, and it was intimidating, and I wasn't quite sure. I, I got chunks, I got little chunks, but really I was just like, okay, just keep swimming, just kind of like Dory, getting through it, just getting through it, just getting through it. Okay, Paul, okay, Apostle Paul, I get it. It's, it's, it's a big deal, but I don't quite get it. But man, as I have taken the time to study prior to this series, it is a theological masterpiece. It is such a beautifully scripted and well-written exposition of the gospel, of the meaning for our faith, for our faith journey. It paints this beautiful picture. And hopefully our prayer is that as we have been journeying from the beginning of Romans till today, that your faith has grown, your understanding of the book of Romans has grown. If you've missed a Sunday, they're all recorded. You can go back and watch it um, and read it again and again so that you make sure you learn and your, your roots and your faith of underst understanding God's word get deeper and deeper. But the book of Romans is fantastic. Paul scripts it so well. In the beginning, he talks about sin, our brokenness, and it wasn't a result of anything that God did. It was all on us. Sin is something, the brokenness of the world, that's, that's on us. It's something that we put on ourselves and on the world, and, and the world was cursed. And so it created this need for redemption, for forgiveness, for, for holiness. And so Paul writes in like the first half of the book of Romans about this need and what fulfilled it. And what fulfilled it was God sending his son Jesus for us. And not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. And he says, through faith in Jesus and faith alone, that you can be saved, that you can start experiencing this journey towards the transformation of who you are into being more like I intended you to be and being a right relationship with me. And when we accept Christ and we, we accept him and we live for him, we're justified. God no longer looks at us as people that are broken, sinful people. He no longer looks at us. He looks at us as justified, just as if we had never sinned. We are new creations living a new life, a victorious life, because we are no longer bound by the chains of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin, but instead we are children of God serving him and loving him. And in Romans 12 is kind of like this pivotal verse. It, everything before it, it centers on setting the scene of our need for Jesus and opening the door to Jesus for everyone. And in chapter 12, Paul says, therefore, in view of everything God has done for you, <laughs> sending his son to die for you and, and offering you the chance for his Holy Spirit to live inside of you, transforming you, in, in view of everything God has done for you, he says it's only reasonable, it's our only reasonable response for us to die to ourselves, to, to, to offer ourselves, all of us, as living sacrifices to him, to give up all of ourselves, to live for him, and to allow him to transform us and to renew our minds. He goes on and he explains that we are to live in love and in integrity and in peace, and we are to build one another up. And today, as we conclude the book of Romans, today we will learn that what I believe the book of Romans is all about is that we can live with hope. Romans is about hope in the midst of sin and brokenness in our world. And so this morning, 
in classic PJ, Pastor John fashion. If you brought your Bible with you, whether it be paper or on a smartphone app, it doesn't matter. As long as you have it, we have them in front of you in the pews as well. If you brought your Bible with you, we value this book right here. It is God's Word. So we want to celebrate it this morning. Just raise it loud and proud and say, I got my Bible, PK. I got my Bible, PK. Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Turn to chapter Romans 16. We're going to be reading the final chapter of the book of Romans in a moment. And by the way, that was such a beautiful picture. You should have seen all the Bibles raised. I mean, if you're in the back there, you saw them, right? But like from here, is this a beautiful picture? And all your smiling faces holding up the Word of God. That was awesome. That was awesome. So I just have to celebrate that moment right there. Okay. But before we dive in, I got to be honest. Last week, when Pastor John was preaching, great sermon, great sermon, honey. <laughs> but he said, he said something to the degree of, Chapter 15 is really the conclusion of the book of Romans. You remember something like that? He, he, Apostle Paul actually ends it with a hearty amen. This is what I have to say. And I'm sitting there in the front pew going, wait a second, I got to preach next week. There's one more chapter to this thing. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, great. What am, what am I supposed to say? He's already, you know, Romans is done. Here comes Christia. Okay, by the way, you know, but, but, <laughs> but as I looked into this chapter, you know, initially it was a little bit of a struggle because I thought, well, you know, apparently Pastor, uh, Apostle Paul has said all that there needs to be said. But as I looked, I figured out this is the perfect sermon for a person like myself because I am a classic PS person. I'm a classic postscript person. Let me explain. When I was little and I had learned how to write and then before the age of texting and phones and all this jazz, right? There was paper and pencil or pen. <gasps> and I would sit in class, and I was one of those little girls, uh, young girls that had a new crush every week. And it was like the classic love letter in class when you're not supposed to be writing little notes. And Dear so-and-so, I think you're really cute. Would you go out with me? Check yes or no. Love, Christia. And then at the bottom, I'd be like, P.S., you're really hot. Um, you know, and I always have like the P.S. tagline to something. Or I would write a letter to my cousins. Or I'd write a letter to my BFF. And I would have a P.S. Sometimes I would have a P.S.S. And then the P.S.S.S. I, I don't know if that exists. But I probably had one of those every once in a while. But fast forward, even today, I am a classic P.S. person. In the age of texting, in the age of phones, I'm a classic PS person. What I mean by that is, John literally told me this week that whenever I leave the house to go pick up Jillian from school or to go get groceries or any kind of errand, if I go out for an appointment, he takes, I don't have my phone here as a visual, but he, he has his phone. He turns up the volume or he makes sure he kind of has one eye on it, one eye on something else for about five minutes. Why? Because even if we just ended a conversation, even if I just said goodbye, I'll be walking within five minutes. Oh, oh, I got to tell him something. So I'll text him or I'll call him my PS. And so this sermon is actually perfect because this is kind of like Paul's PS. And unlike my PSs on my notes or my phone calls, some of them might be actually legitimately important. This is so important. This is kind of like Paul saying, hey, in case you missed what this is all about, let me just kind of remind you real quick here before I move on in my, in my journey, in my missionary journey. Let, let me just let you know what's up. <laughs> in case you missed it, I need to remind you again of what this is all about. So let's go ahead and see and unpack chapter 16 together and see what Paul has to say about living with hope and how we can live with hope today. So, Romans 16, starting in verse 1, we're going to read through verse 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Centrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. 
Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Adonicus and Junia, my fellow Jews have, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the, the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, my co our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristopolis. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Let's go ahead and practice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> now, you're probably wondering, what on earth? That was just a list of names. I don't know. I'm guilty in my past. And even with this, when I was reading through this, I mean, this, this is just a name, group of names. Does anyone, I mean, this, let's be honest, anyone, when they're reading through the Bible, see a group of names and you just kind of go, eh, you skip ahead to like the real sentences, right? The real text, right? I, I'm, I've been there. And, and you don't really know anything about this people. You figure, okay, well, they're obviously no longer here with us. Let's move on to something that's more relevant. I mean, that's kind of where your mind goes. But it's interesting. <laughs> that this, these 16 verses can preach in and of itself. A list of names can preach in and of itself. Because when you start looking into it, there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of information in this list of names. And the main thing that Paul is trying to get across in here is that all people are valid. <clears throat> all people are valid. Everybody who calls themselves a Christian that is living for Jesus Christ is a part of God's kingdom. And not only that, they are called to lead in it. They can lead in it. <clears throat> it's not just a random list of names. Paul's a smart guy. He just didn't put a random list of names in there. There's more to it than that. And later, when you look and you read the book of Galatians, there's this interesting verse, a great verse, in chapter 3, verse 28, that says, where Paul writes, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor, are, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All the people mentioned in the first 16 verses of Romans 16 fit the bill. They fit this verse. No one is excluded. Race cannot separate you. Your ethnicity, your background can't separate you from God's kingdom. Your gender cannot separate you from God's kingdom. Your social status cannot separate you from God's kingdom. That's why we, that's one of the reasons we can live with hope because no one is excluded. No one is off limits from knowing Jesus, from experiencing the life transforming love of Jesus, our Savior. Some exact direct examples in the text, just to kind of throw this out there for you guys. Phoebe. Phoebe was a woman. In those days, women weren't necessarily given leadership and, and weren't looked up to in society. And, and Phoebe, Phoebe was a woman. Not only that, she was a deacon in the church. She was a leader in the church. And she had, he says, great influence. And he, she had financial resources in which she was able to bless people. She was, she was a well-off woman of society that was a leader in the church. And she was a female. Adronicus and Junia, later on, uh, they're described as um, a team. And likely they were a husband and wife team, and they were both called apostles. Another interesting thing is that Adronicus is actually derived, when you look at the names and you do a name study, Adronicus is a Jewish name, whereas Junia is actually a Latin Roman citizen name. So we have two backgrounds, two races, two ethnicities that are uh, joined together as a potentially a husband and wife team, and they're leaders. They're called apostles in the church. We also look, there's several names in there, the household of Aristopolis, uh, Herodian, and, and many others. When you look at the name studies, you find out they're actually slave names. Now, 
the historians don't know if they were slaves at this time or if they were freed men and, uh, at this time, but at one point or another, they were considered slaves. No one is off limits from God. And each one of these people, he says, greet one another. Welcome one another. No matter what the background, no matter where you've come from, respect one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And that everyone has a role. Everyone can have a role to play in the body of God. It's just so beautiful, this picture, the body of Christ that is painted within this. What does that mean for us today? What does that mean for me? How can I live with hope? That means no matter where you've come from, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what uh, sins of the fathers or uh, hereditary things have followed through the past or where you are at in society, whether you have a blue collar job, a white collar job, whether you got a college degree or you didn't, whether you graduate high school or you didn't, whether you are a female or a male, it doesn't matter this morning. No matter what you've done in your past, no matter what you're doing now, nothing. God says, you are welcome. You can come into a relationship with me. You could be a part of my kingdom and you matter. I have a purpose for you. No matter where you've come from, I love you. I cherish you. I value you. And I have a place for you in my kingdom. And that is one of the reasons we can live with hope, Paul says. Because no one is excluded from the love of God. No one is excluded from value and purpose in his kingdom. Continuing on in Romans 16, verses 17 through 19, Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Paul's saying here that we need to keep the unity. We can live with hope if we keep the unity within the body of Christ. He says there's going to be some crazy teachings that come. Like there's going to be some people that are trying to divide you and these teachers are going to try to divide you and get you off of the, the, off of the truth of the gospel. And there's going to be these divisions and, these, and maybe discourse among you and they're, they're going to try and sway you and to try and divide the body of Christ. And he says stay unified together. This is how we can have hope together is key, being together, not letting any teachings or anything come across your path that will divide you. (laughs) I think today there are still teachings out there that seek to divide. And it may not look like arguments or extreme divisions in, in within the church, but what I think right now we're experiencing is a division by absence. Because one of the teachings that is out there is that you don't need to be in this place. You don't need to meet with this group of people in order to live out your faith, to have a relationship with God. It's, it, it, you can stay at home and watch a TV preacher, and, and that's good enough. You can stay home and read your Bible once a week, and that's good enough. You can, you can go to a mountain retreat and, or go fishing, and that's your church, right? There's these songs that's like, that's my church, whatever that is, that's my church. Well, you know what? God says he wants this to be the church. There is a group of people that he sent his son to die for. And that is the bride of Christ. That is the church. And we need to stay committed. And that is a divisive teaching that by saying, hey, you can go at it alone. Then we kind of make up excuses. And all of a sudden, we trickle out. We fade out. And we have to be careful because... Those teachings prey on, he says, naive minds, naive minds. We can't have shallow faith. We can't have shallow faith. We can't just punch our ticket, say, okay, I said a prayer and I'm headed to heaven. Hallelujah, amen, I'm going to go on and move, live in my life and, and do my own thing. No, no. He wants us to grow and to sharpen one another and to grow roots in our faith. He doesn't want us to have naive minds. And one of the ways we do that is by meeting here in this place, staying committed to one another in the faith and being bold and staying true to the gospel. One of the ways, one of the things that's been really awesome to hear recently uh, from our church has been a couple of like rogue groups that have started up. They, They come to Sunday morning and they say, you know what, this is good, but 
I need more ironing, iron sharpening iron kind of action. I need to grow more in my faith. And, and they've found maybe a person or two to kind of help them in their journey to not be, not have naive minds, but to develop the root system that goes deep in the faith. And I, and I asked uh, Sam or Honey to come forward and kind of share about uh, just his journey in that and uh, what has happened. Um, we have been rejoicing in this. I thought it was awesome um, that some of you, we didn't like ask for this we didn't give you any we gave blessing come on Sam. you're fine uh <laughs> we didn't say uh you know you have to get get permission from us first this is something that god is moving in the hearts of his people so um got red mic <laughs> yeah so kind of how i mean do, do oh is it on here, right? I'm pretty loud. so um kind of what happened is uh george was doing some work at my house for me and uh so we developed a really good friendship and uh, through that friendship, you know, we decided, hey, George kind of approached me, um, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say mentorship, but kind of as a friend, you know, we, we both, uh, as we we're talking and, and developing the friendship, both uh, decided, hey, we need more than this. We need to be, uh, you know, we need someone to hold each, o- each other accountable. Um, we were both sharing that. And uh, so something that, that spurred up through George's leadership was, hey, let's meet, you know, and let's hold each other accountable. Um, Let's be vulnerable with one another. These are things that I'm struggling with. You've shared some things that you're struggling with. Let's hold each other accountable. And I think it's important and kind of deals with what Christy is talking about today and what the Lord's sharing. And um, if you look at what this, you know, she called me a week ago and said, hey, read the scripture, kind of share what you feel. Um, When you read it and you see all these names, he's talking about how they they came before him, how some of them came after him. And he's bringing all these names and how, um, how they're important to his ministry and how important they were to each other's ministry to hold each other accountable. And he urges, urges us and urges that community of believers to, to be vulnerable with one another, um, to be authentic with one another, and just to be there for one another. And by doing so, we can protect ourselves from, you know, just maybe not even people that creep into the church that try to harm us, but from, from ourselves. Um, you know, I found in my life I tend to... Uh, look at things and say, oh, well, that's okay. Well, yeah, maybe it's okay, but the aftermath of it is not okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the things that start happening behind, behind that or through that is not okay. And so uh, it protects us as with, with George and I when we meet every other Thursday. Sometimes, you know, we have to even bring ourselves back. It's been a couple of weeks where we have to say, George will call me and say, hey, we haven't met. We, we need to get together. Or, and it's not even something that's um, – maybe import, important in the grand scheme of things like, oh, oh I'm struggling with this. It's, it's more of we just need to meet with one another to keep, our, to keep ourselves sharp to make sure that we're in the word or to make sure that we're, I'm not overeating or I'm not doing this or I'm not doing that. Or, you know, so it's, it's very important, and I think it kind of ties into what Christy is saying. So. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing, Sam. And so in case you were looking for permission, and I don't know why I'm using this, I'm going to go ahead and put it in the mic stand. (laughs) So in case you are looking for permission to do accountability, to do mentoring, you know what it takes? It takes a willing heart. It takes a vulnerable heart. It takes a willingness to listen to one another and appoint one another to God. You could do a small group Bible study. You can do a mentoring. uh, You can meet with one another. But Paul says, sharpen your mind because the teachings, the things that cause to divide you, they go after minds that are weak that are naive and so if you're looking for permission if you've been just waiting for an opportunity go forth find a friend find someone that is here if, if you're not quite sure who but you like to get in touch with someone um, and meet with someone talk to us we'll, we'll help you let's sharpen one another let's help each other develop that root system of faith that goes deep so we can uh, just keep trudging along together as the body of Christ as Paul instructs And finally, verses 20 through 27, Paul writes, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I love that. Let me just read that again. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Amen. Amen. (laughs) The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my co-worker, sends you sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Cordus, send you their greetings. 
Now to him who is, estable, who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Paul writes about hope here. He says, if, if you don't have enough hope that I've chosen you and, and that I've given you a body of a, a family to do life with and to do faith with, man, you can have hope because you could trust me. You could trust God for the ultimate victory in your life. He's already won. <laughs> He is our victorious God. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God who is able to establish you in accordance with the gospel of what has been written in the book of Romans. The God who is able to transform your life and to create a holy creature out of you and to make you more like him and to be able to walk with you in relationship with him now. He's doing it. You just have to tap into God and just ask him to be with you, for his grace to go with you, helping you, transforming you. There was once a psychology experiment done years ago using lab rats, and I'm sorry if you love rats or animals, it kind of has a, a morbid part and then a kind of happier part. But for the sake of explaining what happened, I have to tell you the whole story. So there were two groups of lab rats. The first group, group A, were put in a tub of water with no land or surface in sight. And they wanted to see how long they would swim for. So they put these lab rats in the tub of water. And they swam and they swam and they swam and they swam. And about an after an hour, they all died. The end. Okay, so then they had a group over here, group B. They had the lab rats. So they put them in the same tub of water. And they wanted to see how long this group of rats would survive swimming. The difference from group A to group B was that periodically, as they're treading water or swimming, they would lift them up out of the water for a second and then put them back down again. And they continue swimming. And then they would lift them up out of the water and then they would put them back down again and they would continue swimming. Group A swam for an hour. Group B swam for 24 hours with just a periodic lifting up out of the water. They weren't set on any surface. They weren't set free for a while and then recaptured and put back in the water. They were just lifted up. So that begs the question, if unthinking rats, given the opportunity to just be lifted up periodically, gave them hope, to keep on swimming, how much more hope should we live with knowing that we serve the God of peace that crushes Satan under our feet? Right? If, if unthinking rats can just get a moment of rest for just a brief moment and go back and keep swimming for 24 hours, we serve a God that never abandons us. He, if we're in the water, guess what? He's swimming right with us right? He never leaves us. If, if we need a break, he lifts us up and he walks for us. If we need a push, if we need a shove, he is pushing us along, but he never, ever abandons us. He is constantly cheering us on. And God says, I love you. <laughs> I sent my son for you to die on the cross. And, and he's not dead. We have hope because he's a risen savior and he has gone up and he has prepared a place for us so that we can be in his presence for all eternity. If unthinking lab rats could be lifted temporarily out of water and swim for 24 hours, we can make it, guys. We can make it in this life that is broken and that is, is desperate for a savior. We can make it because we who live for Christ are never abandoned. He is constantly with us in whatever situation we are in. And God says we can live with hope because of this. We can live with hope. Paul's PS in Romans is an important one. He says, in case you missed it, this whole book is about even though there's sin in this world, we can live with hope 
And this hope isn't just to a set, single set group of people. It is available to all people, to all people. And I just didn't, I, I don't expect you to do it alone. I expect you to sharpen one another. I expect you to meet with one another and keep unity within this group of people. And he says, and by the way, P.S., I have the ultimate victory. I, I've overcome sin and darkness and I am crushing Satan's head. There is no power that is over me. And when I am in you, that same power is inside of you. This is the message of Romans. We can live with hope. We can be transformed. We don't have to wait. We can be transformed now. As you can see this morning, uh, the church looks a little different up here. We have the the garland, and we have, um, it looks like a wedding, right? And uh, there's the buildings being transformed before our very eyes for a wedding that will be taking place later this afternoon today. And as I think about weddings, I think about the bride of Christ and what Paul's message is in the book of Romans. He, his message is, you know, that verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, to be transformed because of all that he's done. And, and you know, I, I got to thinking about us as a bride of Christ, you know, being transformed. And, and personally, one of my favorite moments of a wedding is looking down the aisle, and, and I love looking at the bride coming down the aisle, right? I mean, everyone does. The bride is beautiful. But one of my favorite moments is looking at the groom's face when the bride enters the room or into the space. I mean, that's like one of my favorites, right? I mean, you know, you just have like the shock and the surprise and the awe. And then you have the tears, you know. I love the look on the groom's face. And on my wedding day, when John and I got married almost 14 years ago or so, we yeah, have 14 years ago, almost, I remember staying there with my dad, had my veil over my eyes, and I was so excited to see my groom, you know. I'm so excited. We exchanged notes earlier, and, and I'm getting ready to walk into the church sanctuary. And we step out, and I see... I see the audience off to the side, and, and or audience, friends, family, off to the sides, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I can't see my groom, and I'm like freaking out for a minute, because right in the middle of the aisle, there's a photographer, like totally covering up John's face, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, I'm wanting to see my groom, and there is something blocking my view of John. Now, eventually it got better. You know, he, he, the photographer moved off to the side, and I saw John, and his face was an awful lot like that face there. <laughs> he, I mean, we're, we're both saps. We're both saps, and he was crying, and I was trying to hold together for makeup's sake. Um, but that was, that was kind of like John's face a little bit. But I, once I saw his face, I had that, that peace and that joy just keep on marching down that aisle. <laughs> and God, God's at the end of the aisle of life, right? And it, it, he's with us, but he's also cheering us on. He's like the groom waiting for his beautiful bride, the church, marching down the aisle. And, and sometimes in life, Paul says in Romans, there's, there's things, like there's sin. There's things that block our path. There's teachings that block our path and our vision of God. And he says... Do whatever you need to do to get rid of the distraction, to get whatever is blocking your view of me. Get rid of it. Go around it. Cast it aside. Do whatever you need to do because this, this is me. You know, I'm like, yeah, you got it. You can come. I love you. You're beautiful. You mean so much to me. I sent my son to die for you. You can do this. I am with you every step of the way, every step you make towards the aisle. I am cheering you on. I am calling you forward. You can do this. I want to spend eternity with you, not just a lifetime, but an eternity with you. And you fill my life with joy. And I want you to be I want you to have the full understanding of, of who I am and what the power that I hold can do in your life to transform you, to transform the bride of Christ, to stay strong, to keep marching forward, to keep on swimming and running and jumping and leaping and being carried. Whatever it takes, 
you're going to make it down the aisle, and I want to see you, and I want to be joined with you for all eternity, because I've prepared this wonderful place for you, for all eternity, where you get to be in my presence, where from the very beginning, how I created and intended life to be in right relationship with me, you can be in that presence with me for all eternity in that right relationship as I had intended. That's the message of Romans. That's the message of hope that we have for those that follow Christ. If you're here this morning and, and you don't quite know what that's like, but man, that, that sounds good to you and, and something speaking to your heart and you, you realize that, man, how I'm living, what I'm living for is myself. Maybe it's for things of this world and this is not working out. I'm just still feeling empty. I'm still feeling incomplete. I keep trying different things. Nothing's panning out for me. I could tell you I've been there and nothing is like serving Jesus Christ. Nothing is like living for him and being transformed. No other fun out there compares to the fun I have as being a Christian and as a follower of Jesus. And he has a purpose and a calling for you. He calls you to lead in his church and no one is excluded this morning from being a part of the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can live with hope that you just didn't see our brokenness and our separation and our desire to serve ourselves and just abandon us and just say well okay i guess that didn't work and, and walk away but god instead you decided to pursue us and continue to pursue us and love us and chase us down and renew your covenants with us and and then eventually to send your son to die on a cross and open up the opportunity for all to enter into a relationship with you, to be forgiven, to be justified, to be transformed, to become holy. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, that helps us to survive. God, we thank you that you never abandon us, that we can live with hope. No matter what we are going through in life, you are there, you never abandon us, and we have that hope of eternity spent with you, God, as you had originally intended and created our relationship to be like with you, God. And we just thank you today. We love you today. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for the, uh, your word that you gave to Apostle Paul in this, in this beautiful, beautifully scripted letter where we can look and say, God loves us. He pursues us and he gives us hope. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for being with us this morning. And we just pray that you would go with us as we, as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This morning, I um, just want to extend an invitation to a wedding celebration on behalf of the Perkins family. Their daughter, Emily, will be getting married at 3 p.m. today. They wanted to make sure to invite um, their church family out to that. So if you don't have any plans, they'd love to have your presence here celebrating a marriage with them. And um, we just want to extend the opportunity as we dismiss today. As always, we love for you to be able to stay, chat, fellowship, have a cup of coffee, pray with one another, laugh with one another. Iron sharpens iron, maybe helping one another grow this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your week.